Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, you are at the 2023 Salmon Recovery Application Workshop, and it's 10 a.m. I'm going to wait about another minute just to make sure people that are logging in at the last second uh, can get situated. So we'll actually start at 10.01. Okay, let's get uh, rolling. Um, I'm gonna go over some basic instructions. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, uh, if your name is not showing up correctly, uh, you can hover over your uh, picture and click the more option and you can type in your name. You can see my name's Mark Dubois-Kin, the lower left corner. Um, and then remember all the attendees, if you can, um, you, you will be muted for the entirety of the webinar, so there won't be an opportunity to speak to us. Um, you can use the Q&A function to ask um, grant managers questions. Um, and so that would be great. We do have a couple people alive to answer your questions. And then you can use the chat feature for just general comments and concerns. Um, and then the workshop will be recorded and we will send all the attendees an email after this uh, workshop to let you know uh, when the recording is available to view later. Next slide, please. Uh, my name is Mark uh, Dubojski. I'm the Sam and Grants team uh, manager. And um, before we get going for this year, I just want to say thank you for an awesome 2022. Uh, we had an amazing grant cycle last year when we uh, were given $75 million of supplemental money from the legislature. And so that was amazing to drop into the grant cycle about midstream. Um, we're looking forward to another great year this year. Um, and, and it should be exciting. And um, so let's uh, get going. Next slide, please. So today we're gonna to be covering our annual salmon recovery grant cycle and our primary policy manual number 18. We will be going over uh, some nuances out of that manual. And then we'll also be covering uh, how to use our grant management database, PRISM. And PRISM is for submitting your online applications early on in the grant cycle. And then if you're successful and you are funded, uh, your, your project's funded in the fall, then you will use PRISM to manage your grant uh, to receive the funds from our office. I'm also gonna be going over some other RCO grant programs uh, that are related uh, to the SAMON grant program. Next slide, please. Okay, my uh, spot is just to do the int agency introduction. And then uh, in the blue here, and you'll see the other topics we will be covering. And those will be covered by other staff members. Next slide, please. Okay, you can see here on Mark, uh, I will be followed by Kat. And then Bridget. And then I think next is uh, Kay or Josh, sorry, then Dave, then Kay, and Bob. So those are the presenters today. The, the rest of our team are here. You can, oh, and Alice is at the end, I'm sorry, Alice. And then the rest of our team is shown here. And these are all of our names. And I just wanna recognize this team of 15. It's a great group. We process a lot of stuff. Uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, we're here to help you and serve you. Um, we will be having some transitions uh, in the next uh, few weeks uh, since we've grown so much and we've been distributing so much money. We've had to adjust some of our workload areas. And so rest assured, um, although you may be getting a new grant manager, 
the older former grant manager will be still part of the transition process. So it's uh, we're going to make sure it's as smooth as possible. Um, so for a small uh, time frame, you may have a couple people that you can lean on before it goes to the new person. Next slide, please. Okay, our agency is called the Recreation Conservation Office. Um, and I don't know how much knowledge the attendees in this workshop have about our agency, but uh, there's two parts. There's a recreation and conservation part, and that was what the agency was founded on in 1964. The very first grant program we had was the boating grant program. And uh, they deal a lot with recreation um, programs and wildlife conservation programs. I'm going to get into a little more, a little bit more details on those later. And then our board came along in 1999, and it's the Salmon Recovery Funding Board. Our agency also houses the Governor's Salmon Recovery Office, and they're the uh, statewide policy arm that uh, works with the salmon recovery regions um, to monitor implementation of the salmon recovery plans, to monitor our salmon recovery projects, and, and to just uh, deal with all things salmon and orca. I gotta make sure I mention the orca whales. If Tara's on here, she would kill me if I didn't. Um, so that's kind of the general makeup of our agency. Next slide, please. So specifically for the RCFB, um, some of the programs, the, the bigger ones that they managed are the ALEA program, and you can see what ALEA stands for. Uh, the Land and Water Program, um, Land and Water Conservation Fund Program, and then the Washington Wildlife and Recreation Program. The reason those three are bolded or have check marks next to them is those are the most likely programs that could match some of our uh, salmon grants. Um, and you can see these other programs that are listed here that are not bolded that our recreation side of the house manages. And it's a wide variety of programs on that side of the house. Next slide, please. Now our team, besides the surfboard, we also manage these other salmon grant programs and, and they're all listed on the right. And we co-manage those with the agencies uh, on the left. Um, for example, let's start at the top, um, the, the Brian Abbott Fish Barrier Removal Board, um, that is co-managed with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Dave Caldell is the lead grant manager for that program. For ESRP, Kay Caramiles is the lead, and that's co-managed with Fish and Wildlife also. And then the Family Forest Fish Passage Program is, is managed uh, by Sandy Dots. She is the lead grant manager. And that's co-managed with Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And then uh, the fourth check down is the WICRI program, the Washington Coast Restoration and Resiliency Initiative. And Alyssa Farrell is the lead grant manager on that. And that's co-managed with the uh, Coast Salmon Partnership the Wild Salmon Center, and the Nature Conservancy. And then finally, our last program is the Chehalis Basin Strategy. And that's a unique program focused down in the Chehalis River Basin, primarily in uh, Lewis and Grays Harbor counties. And that's co-managed with the Department of Ecology and the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Next slide, please. Now for our program, our funding is divided into three main pots. Uh, the first two are the surfboard funds, and it's a mixture of state bond funds from the state legislature, and then also our federal funds we get annually through NOAA, and it's from the uh, PAC Center for Pacific Coast Salmon Recovery Fund. And then in our even years, uh, which we just completed last year in 2022, we get an infusion of um, a separate pot of money for the Puget Sound region, and that's called the PSAR funds. And we co-manage those with our sister state agency, the Puget Sound Partnership. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we allocate the funds? Well, first off, you gotta start at the top and our state is divided into seven, or excuse me, eight salmon recovery regions. And you can see them listed on the sheet. And these regions are responsible for developing their uh, salmon recovery uh, plans. And these plans are made up of the four H's. And the H's stand for harvest, hatcheries, hydropower, and habitat. And we're all focused on the habitat, the fourth H. 
And so these plans identify um, priority species, priority streams, and then uh, priority stream reaches, and then priority habitat actions within these reaches um, to uh, pursue. And, and so that's how we uh, work with the regions to implement these re recovery plans. Next slide, please. Now these recovery plans, or excuse me, these recovery regions are then broken down further into what we call lead entities. They're also uh, could be called uh, synonymously as a watershed group. Now some regions are the same as a lead entity like Upper Columbia, Lower Columbia and Snake. But then some regions are broken down further like Puget Sound is broken down into 15 lead entities. Now, what's a lead entity? A lead entity is the administrative body at the local level uh, where there's usually a staff person that manages the local technical advisory group and then the local citizens advisory group. And so they go through the grant process each year of soliciting for projects that fit into that recovery plan actions that I just mentioned. And then they go through the local process of evaluating the technical merits of the projects. And then the citizens do the final rankings of the projects by watershed. And then come this summer, those ranked individual rank lists are submitted to us for funding consideration in September. Um, so the first step to do is to start at the local level and get to know your lead entity coordinator to figure out what the local timeline is and the local process. Next slide, please. So how do we distribute the money? Well, this is the rough allocation for uh, how we distribute the money to all the, the regions. You can see the different percentages. So for example, if we had $20 million to allocate this year, um, you can see at the bottom, Upper Columbia gets a little over 10%. So they'd get right around $2 million, a little over $2 million to allocate for their region. So they'd be soliciting for, habitat restoration, protection, and uh, design projects to fill out their $2 million they have to allocate to projects this year. Now you can see in the down near the bottom of the Puget Sound, they get 30% of the annual allocation, or excuse me, 38% of the annual allocation, but then they have to break that allocation down further into the 15 lead entities. So that 38% is divided amongst 15 lead entities. And they have specific criteria based on species, uh, a, a freshwater stream miles, saltwater stream miles um, to help uh, figure out how to distribute the money further. Next slide, please. So why are we doing all this? Well, you can see uh, with this slide, this is from the most recent State of the Salmon Report. Um, starting from the left to right, you can see the individual uh, stocks, salmon and steelhead stocks and, and their statuses. Red's bad on the right, is greenish, turquoise blue is good. Uh, so you can see some of the, there's five stocks in crisis. And then there's a couple stocks at the right that are approaching the recovery goals, meaning they're getting nearer to delisting from the Endangered Species Act. Next slide, please. So I've thrown a lot at you at this time. If there's any questions, fire them off in the chat or the, the Q&A and uh, some of our grant managers will address that. Other than that, I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Kat. Thanks, Mark. Hi, my name is Kat Moore and I'm one of the senior grant managers for the Salmon team. I'm going to go over what's new for the 2023 grant round. Next slide. We have a couple of changes that affect acquisition projects. We have new rules around the acquisition of uplands and we've clarified guidance on what uses are prohibited and allowed on properties acquired with surfboard funds. We have a couple changes impacting design and restoration projects. And we've clarified the process for seeking cost increases through the grant round. Next slide. So we have two changes that impact acquisition projects. The first is the policy on acquisition of uplands. We've clarified that if you're planning on acquiring a property with more than 50% uplands, you'll need to provide more than 15% match. And we break it down further and Bridget's gonna go over that in the acquisition section. We've also provided guidance on how to determine your upland acreage. In the past, um, 
different sponsors quantify acreage types in different ways. And so we're trying to provide you some guidance on how to make that more uniform. So you'll be asked to quantify your upland acreage and other habitat types like tidelands, wetlands, lakes, riparians, and their associated buffers. And so we provide that guidance in Appendix L. And you'll be asked questions about this in PRISM as well as the metrics that you'll be reporting on your acquisition projects. Next slide. We've updated the manual this year to provide some clarity about what is allowed and what isn't allowed on surfboard acquired properties. All RCO funded fee simple properties must be open and available for public use unless otherwise approved by RCO as an exception. However, public use on surfboard sites is generally limited to low impact, passive recreational and cultural uses consistent with salmon recovery purposes and consistent with the deed of right. Over the years, RCO has allowed some infrastructure to remain or be built to facilitate recreation or restoration on the site. And this new policy clarifies what new or existing infrastructure is allowed, including things like unpaved parking and associated access roads, trails and gates, uh, fencing paths, signs and kiosks, benches and tables, and some maintenance structures. There's more detail than what I'm going into here about these allowed uses and prohibited uses. So be sure to check out the section titled Public Use Infrastructure in the manual. And for your purposes, during the application process, discuss your plans for any development um, with your grant manager, as RCO will need to review any plans in accordance with this policy. We also clarify that although some infrastructure may be allowed, it may not be eligible for reimbursement. Reimbursement is only allowed if it's already listed as an existing eligible cost in one of our CO manuals. So um, those are our manual three is for acquisition or manual five for restoration. For example, we allow um, reimbursement of um, fencing for acquisition costs. So that's already something that's eligible. So that would be eligible. However, we don't have, um, we don't allow uh, reimbursement for things like benches or tables right now in um, our acquisition projects. Next slide. We've updated our Appendix D, which is our design appendix, um, which talks about the deliverables for planning projects. Um, so there's no longer a D1, D2, D3, D4, for those of you who are familiar with Appendix D. Now there is simply a project deliverables table and descriptions that follow and define what those deliverables are. We've also changed the name of design build to field fit to better describe what it refers to in this context. Next slide. We've responded to rising costs and sponsor requests to raise the amount of funding you can request for design only grants. These are projects that will produce either a preliminary or final design. So you may now request up to $350,000, used to be 200, without bringing any match. We've also increased the time allowed for design only grants to two years, used to be 18 months. We've also raised the threshold for design, pro or excuse me, for restoration projects for when preliminary designs are required at application. So if you're requesting less than $350,000 in funding for your restoration project, you aren't required to provide a preliminary design at application. You're still encouraged to, and uh, you know our review panel would thank you very much, and I'm sure your local reviewers as well, if you provided um, a preliminary design. And you will be required to provide it during the life of the project if you're funded. Um, but it's, uh, you know, we've raised that bar in response to rising costs of designs. And to give you the opportunity to take advantage of the design only grants. Next slide, please. So um, next to the last change I'm gonna talk about is something that's a change for projects that you may already have under agreement with us that you've already received funding for. So although we encourage you to craft 
solid budgets, sometimes unanticipated situations arise. So you, you might run into unexpected or increased costs. You may be in a situation where you need additional funding to accomplish the scope of your work. We call these cost increase amendments. And the process for requesting additional funding and who needs to approve it is found in our manual. As soon as you know that you're going to need um, some additional funding, call your grant manager and call your lead entity coordinator to talk with them about the best way forward. Um, each year, the surfboard sets aside a dedicated cost increase fund, and sometimes there's additional funds that are available. There may be PSAR funds available if you're in the Puget Sound. Um, there may be return funds in your lead entity that need to be allocated within that year. But generally, those return fund pots, as we call them, are for smaller cost increases. Cost increases aren't guaranteed, and they require support from your lead entity, as well as approval from the RCO director. If you have significant cost increase needs, you may be required to apply for additional funding through the grant round process, or we may be out of funds. We may not have any return funds to provide for a cost increase. So talk to your lead entity coordinator, find out what the local process is for approving a cost increase and to be considered through the grant room process. At a minimum, this is kind of a change, we will, you will be required to submit an amendment request form and an updated cost estimate budget by the application deadline. So this is so that we're all aware that you have a cost increase that's gonna show up on a lead entity ranked list and will need to be reviewed by lead entity staff and RCO staff and perhaps review panel, um, review panel if there's any change in your scope. Um, so this is just a screenshot showing that the amendment request form was found on our website, which we'll talk about later when we go live. And I've also got a screenshot of our website to show you where that is. Next slide. So I'll pause here. That's a lot of new information. The grant managers will go through some of these again. So you'll hear them in the sections that they apply towards um, if you stay on for the rest of the webinar. Um, but I'm gonna pause in case there's any questions about what's new. I don't see anything, but let's see, there's one Q&A. Will green stormwater infrastructure be allowed on lands with surfboard funds? I'm writing a response to that right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, that one hasn't particularly been addressed in the yeah. prohibited and allowed uses. Um, that would probably need to go through an allowable use determination. I don't know what Alyssa's going to respond. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> so that's a good question, Denise. Um, we can definitely talk to our pilot, put it on one of our lists. We have a, internally, just so all of you know, we have a, um, a team of grant managers that's across our agency that we call the compliance team. And often if there are uses that aren't in, um, you know, on lists of things that we've already thought about or are requested, we work with our compliance team. We also have compliance specialists and, um, and then we might need to go through our director. Um, we might raise it to our policy team and, and actually put it on a policy. So if it becomes something that, um, that becomes common, we'd like to, to answer that for you. So thanks for that. Okay, next slide. All right, so you're considering applying for surfboard funding. Well, what does a good salmon recovery project look like? Your project should protect or restore critical salmon habitat. It should address a lead entity strategy or recovery plans, Mark mentioned. And you'll need to be able to put the funds to work quickly. Projects should be completed within two to three years of funding approval. You'll need to apply locally. Um, so you'll need to get to know your lead entity coordinators, pay attention to their schedules, attend their meetings, know what their uh, potential funding allocation is and what their ranking criteria are. Each watershed is unique. And while Surfboard doesn't have a maximum grant request, you'll, you know, it's a good idea to stay within your lead entity allocation because that's the funding that's available. And know that we typically require 15% of the total cost of your project be matched, um, but we'll get into some exceptions later. Next slide. 
So here's that screenshot of our website that I mentioned um, at the top. Uh, when you log in to rco.wa.gov, um, you'll want to hover over grants at the top there and all the grant programs that our agency manages will pop up. We are salmon slash PSAR. And when you click on the salmon PSAR grants page website, um, this, form, this page has all the forms, manuals, the calendar, information, everything you need to be a successful applicant. Um, so take some time to familiarize it, uh, familiar, familiarize yourself with it. Um, our website has the link to manual 18. It's circled here in red. Read it and, and it just says grant manual. It actually doesn't say 18, but it's the grant manual for our program. Uh, read, read the manual, especially the chapters relating to grant application and implementation guidelines. We update it every year um, for the coming grant round. And depending on your project type, you should also familiarize yourself with manuals for restoration or acquisition. So take the time to check those out. There are links on this website for that. So on the right hand side of this website, you'll find all the forms you need. The grant forms are listed first. Those are the application forms followed by the forms that you'll need once you get funded. And so that cost increase request form is down there in the salmon PSAR resources, which are kind of our active grant forms. We include a calendar with the grant round schedule, as well as links to this workshop, other workshops, and more information. Next slide. So who's eligible to apply? As you can see by this list, almost any organization may apply for a salmon recovery grant. Even private landowners may apply for restoration projects on their own property. Federal agencies and for-profit companies are not eligible applicants. But if you have a great restoration project on, own, on land owned by the federal government or a for-profit entity, that's eligible. It just needs to be sponsored by an eligible applicant and have the landowner on board. For surfboard, state agencies are eligible, but they must have a local partner to provide their own matching funds or in-kind contribution to the project. Next slide. So now I'll pass it over to some other grant managers to go over the four types of eligible projects, acquisition, planning, restoration, combination of those, or monitoring. Um, and so thanks. If there's any questions about what I said, happy to take them. No questions at the moment. Thanks. Good morning. I'm grant manager Bridget Kaminsky. I'll be covering acquisitions. <clears throat> RCO funds many projects that purchase real property where the intention is to protect or restore salmon habitat. Your fee simple purchase or conservation easement acquisition project is forever in perpetuity. Leases are not eligible for surfboard grants. There will be long-term obligations and restrictions that sponsors must adhere to even beyond the term of the grant agreement. Buildings used to benefit salmon habitat may be allowed to remain on the property, but if no benefit is warranted, then they must be moved off the property or be demolished. RCO does not allow res um, restrictions, covenants, or encumbrances that conflict with salmon recovery program goals. Next slide, please. Understand that required matched amounts will increase as the percentage of uplands on your acquisitions increase. The more uplands, the more match. For example, up to 50% uplands will require 15% match, 50 to 75% uplands require 25% match, and greater than 75% uplands require 35% match. Be sure to read your manual 18 for the specifics of what qualifies as uplands. Next slide, please. If your project is to purchase property from multiple owners and meets salmon recovery program, program goals, consider proposing a multi-site acquisition project. These properties ideally should be contiguous and each property should contain similar conservation values. The map on the left shows the progress that King County has made over just a few years. The yellow shaded parcels uh, were purchased over time and are now part of King County's natural area. The blue hash line areas indicate conservation easements. 
For multi-site acquisition projects, you will need to provide a map of the geographic envelope and a prioritization strategy so we know which parcels you are targeting to acquire and in what order. The map on the right is a map taken from the Skagit Watershed Council Protection Strategy. It illustrates tiered target areas for habitat restoration and, pro and protection in the Skagit River Basin. Next slide, please. The acquisition toolkit is available on our website to familiarize yourself with RCO Salmon Grant acquisition project requirements and to position you for a prompt escrow payment or a reimbursement of your purchase price and incidentals. Next slide, please. In addition to the acquisition information included in Manual 18 and the acquisition toolkit, you will also want to familiarize yourself with Manual 3. Make sure you have the most recent version and feel free to reach out to your grant manager for support. Being prepared and knowing what to expect will help you budget and plan your surfboard project proposal appropriately. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Acquisition projects receiving surfboard funding are required to follow the uniform real property acquisition procedures, which include, but not necessarily limited to, sending a letter or email to landowners to let them know they are not required to sell their property and that condemnation is not allowed. Determining if there are businesses or residential tenants, and if there are, you are required to provide relocation assistance per the Uniform Relocation Act and sending a letter outlining the fair market value determined by your reviewed appraisal as just compensation. Documentation of these requirements is a must before RCO will reimburse you for your acquisition costs. Next slide, please. If you're funded and before we issue the project agreement, RCO requires preliminary title report along with a title review checklist that notes which encumbrances will be removed prior to purchase. You might wanna check the title before you initiate a surfboard grant application to be sure the property is a good fit. Encumbrances on titles need to align with salmon recovery. So for example, if you're purchasing a riverside parcel with a levy for a floodplain restoration project, make sure there isn't a flood reduction easement on that levy unless you are willing to put in the time and work to have that easement extinguished. A deed of right is required for fee simple acquisitions. It protects the state's investment in land acquired and conveys to the Washington residents rights to preserve, protect, and use the property for public purposes consistent with the grant program and the project agreement forever. An assignment of rights is required for less than fee acquisitions, such as conservation easements. It ensures RCO has certain rights for access and stewardship of the property and is intended to secure the public's interest in the easement by holding the sponsor responsible to monitor and enforce the terms of the easement it indemnifies the state and it requires the sponsor to consult with RCO for any amendments or conversions of the land. Next slide, please. As a general rule, don't start project activities before your grant agreement is signed, even if your project ranks at the top of your lead entity's funding list. You will want to check in with your grant manager before you start any work. However, if you do need to acquire property before you've gotten your grant agreement, we can help you by issuing, issuing a waiver of retroactivity. You will need to contact your grant manager at least 30 days before closing and, and email a request with details about the property, the landowner acknowledgement form, the voluntary acquisition notice, and the preliminary title checklist. Next slide, please. If you are working with a partner organization to purchase the property before being awarded a grant agreement, you will need to know about RCO's partnership policy. It's not intuitive, so work with your grant manager and make sure the partner gets a waiver of retroactivity before closing as it's purchased, as it's their purchase that will be subject to the RCO policies and reimbursed with RCO grant funds. Next slide, please. 
Acquiring property with RCO funding forever unites your organization with RCO in perpetuity. Accepting surfboard grant funding requires a long-term commitment to keep the primary focus of the site consistent with the salmon recovery funding program. Once the project is complete, you will need to steward the property according to your stewardship plan or for some restoration projects, your landowner agreement. Incompatible uses of acquisition property can cause compliance issues. There are exceptions for acts of nature and vandalism, however. Next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> uses are generally limited to restoration and protection for salmon recovery purposes. All fee simple properties acquired with surfboard funds must be available for public use. Public use of surfboard funded sites generally will be limited to low impact, passive recreational and cultural uses consistent with the salmon recovery purposes funded by surfboard. As part of your application process, you should check with your grant manager for any existing or planned permanent uses, improvements or infrastructure that you might be considering. Some existing infrastructure may be kept if it's essential to support safe and sustainable public use. If you plan to install or build infrastructure after grant closure, RCO will need to approve that it, uh, the proposal in accordance with our policy. Next and final slide, please. Make sure RCO grants will be used to acquire property designated for salmon habitat and recovery and habitat recovery forever. Even though the previous slide indicated that some infrastructure may be allowed, most will cause compliance issues. We have seen these situations arise and the conversion and property replacement recertification process is onerous. You will want to avoid future conversions, so plan ahead and carve out incompatible and ineligible uses from the scope of your project. You may need to adjust the legal description, update maps, project costs, and the deed of right in order to target salmon recovery habitat. Anticipate future needs like expansions of existing roads or well sites or other utilities and access easements for neighboring properties. Remember to work with your grant manager. We are always here to help. And I'm finished with my portion. Thank you, Bridget. Hello, everybody. My name is Josh Lambert, and I'll be presenting a few more project types funded by the surfboard, starting with planning projects. So planning projects include the following types you see on this slide. These can be applied for as standalone projects or combined in various forms with themselves, or for instance, an acquisition project. Planning projects should be completed within two years and address limiting factors to salmon recovery and identified within your region's salmon recovery plan. Design criteria for conceptual through final design are outlined in Manual 18, Appendix D. Your designs are required to meet Appendix D guidelines. Next slide, please. So the first type, assessments, are an initial precursor to further efforts. They employ a variety of field and remote methods to identify solutions to limiting factors at typically a watershed or sub-basin geographic area. Ultimately, the deliverables of assessments should lead to a scientifically sound recommendation of potential strategies and actions. If numerous recommendations are developed, like in the example of a restoration or acquisition strategy, a list of actions should be prioritized in order of importance. Deliverables of an assessment must clearly determine the criteria used to develop options for subsequent projects and present a schedule of implementa implementation. <clears throat> Note that you must acquire a letter of support from your recovery region's field staff or staff and submit it at the initial application due, due date. This is to ensure the assessment work aligns with, with recovery goals. The next stage of an assessment project is often a design phase that produces a site-specific restoration design, or in some cases an acquisition project if protection is the preferred approach or a necessary precursor. Next slide, please. Assessment projects that do not result in a site-specific design are only eligible for state funding. In the Puget Sound and Hood Canal areas, assessment projects must use 
Puget Sound Acquisition and Restoration, or PISAR funds. Since new PISAR projects are only available in even year grant rounds, check with your local lead entity to determine if they have any available unallocated PISAR funds from a previous biennium before starting an application in an odd year. More than likely, you should plan to submit an assessment only project in, on even year grant rounds only. Applications outside the Puget Sound and Hood Canal region may use state surfboard funding and may apply for assessment funds on an annual basis. But each grant round is subject to, each region is subject to a $200,000 cap for all assessments in any given year per region. Regions may submit more than one project, but the total amount, not including match, may not exceed $200,000. Next slide, please. As we discussed, planning phases can be combined into a single project scope. For instance, a project may propose an assessment or inventory project that also includes a site-specific design for smaller geographic range or a portion of the assessment scope. An example is advancing one or more of the highest rated passage barriers in an inventory to some level of site-specific design. If you choose to combine an assessment and design, please consider the regional funding constraints in the previous slide. To avoid the limits on state funding with assessments, your combination assessment and design project must include site-specific designs that make up the majority of the project scope or cost. To be eligible for no match planning project, you must produce at minimum preliminary designs as defined in Manual 18, Appendix D. Next slide, please. Site-specific design projects are reviewed by the surfboard review panel and local technical teams to ensure that they're technically proficient, they reflect the best engineering practices for your proposed actions, and have, have a high chance of achieving salmon recovery goals. Appendix D and Manual 18 provides guidelines for designs that follow well-accepted standards, and they're meant to be general enough to encompass the wide variety of restoration projects funded by surfboard. It's not just advisable to follow Appendix D, but a requirement. Consider providing Appendix D language and format to your design teams when developing scopes of work. Now in 2023, Appendix D underwent a considerable format change. Instead of subchapters outlining the three eligible planning phases, the D1, 2, and 3, a project deliverable table was created. This table lists deliverables in rows and project design stages in columns and allows a user to quickly identify what deliverables are due depending on the stage of design. Each project deliverable is further described in detail following this chapter in Appendix D, following this table. Next design, uh, slide please. Now let's delve a little bit further into the three design types we find. Although percentages such as 30, 60, or 90% in design are useful and heavily used in engineering plans, Manual 18 avoids them and sticks to the following three stages. First, conceptual design is a product of feasibility and site scoping activities where enough information is known to consider all alternatives and choose a preferred alternative. A rudimentary plan drawing should be provided to clearly illustrate all proposed project concepts of the preferred alternative. Just as important, the design correspondence that led to the preferred alternative should be captured in a basis of design report. Finally, the project concept should be understood well enough for a sponsor to complete a reasonable construction estimate. Preliminary design is meant to take the concept and run it through its paces. Site survey and technical evaluation analysis will have been completed and be robust enough to document existing conditions and illustrate, illustrate proposed actions and the desired response they will have on existing conditions. Design drawings should include plan views, profiles, and other supporting visual drawings made at a consistent scale and with enough surveyed or modeled environmental information to show how project elements interact with the natural variation of a site. A preliminary design report fully characterizes the site and its unique conditions and provides a detailed overview and rationale of design criteria used as well as a refined analysis with supporting dependencies to demonstrate with a high value level of uncertainty how a project will perform. We often like to term preliminary designs as permit ready, and it's a good way of thinking of what the final product of the stage should be. Next stage, slide please. 
Final designs are effectively preliminary designs that are refined to the point where technical specs and quantities can be provided to an installer or contractor. For instance, mobilization locations, dewatering plans, erosion control, and specific quantities and types of materials are often added or refined at this stage. They should incorporate comments from permitters and stakeholders and effectively be bid ready to some degree. As built designs are a post construction deliverable that are necessary if at any point during construction substantial changes were requested and implemented. As, as built are sometimes as simple as profile drawing with a revised elevation called out in red. Other times they are comprehensive design reports and associated drawings that document what was produced during construction. They are a particularly important deliverable for field fit projects. They may not have provided highly refined drawings or used typicals initially. In these cases, construction supervision is critical to ensure as built are produced accurately. Next slide, please. Another change of Appendix D that Kat alluded to earlier in 2023 is updating the term design build to field fit. Like design build, field fit are still restoration projects that are allowed to proceed directly to construction following completion of a preliminary design and any necessary permits. If they meet the following quali qualifications, field fit are appropriate when the sponsor and design team have extensive experience successfully implementing the project, the project type is less complicated with well-established methods. Liability and landowner concerns are minimal, with low risk for damaging critical infrastructure and existing intact salmon habitat. The design is straightforward, requiring less detailed drawings for permitting and construction than typically would be required as part of a final design report. As mentioned earlier, as-built designs are an important deliverable for this project type. Next slide, please. Now, because surfboard projects occur in highly nat variable natural environments, what you propose in your design application at funding typically contains many unknowns until you receive funding and actually begin design work. Field survey, geotech work, modeling, landowner and permitting agencies can all cause the initial concept to change. So make sure you communicate with your grant manager early when a major design change is being considered to ensure the project stays on track and that the scope of work is still appropriate for surfboard funding. All prior surfboard funded deliverables must be completed and reviewed for a subsequent funding request. Strive to submit your planning materials with your complete application two weeks prior to site visits, but no later than the June final application deadline. Consider, however, that later in the application review cycle, you submit design and planning documents to less opportunity for helpful technical feedback from reviewers or chances to spot failed flaws. An application with incomplete materials at the June deadline will be withdrawn by RCO or lead entity staff. Next slide, please. When it comes to design projects, there are pathways to acquiring funding without the surfboard's minimum 15% match requirement. Specifically, if your request is less than 350,000, you commit to producing a minimum preliminary design and you can complete the project within two years of funding award date you can request a no-match design project. If your project does not meet all the required criteria, then you must provide 15% match. Likewise, if you have an active no-match agreement, and if at any point you cannot meet these criteria, 15% match may be applied to your agreement. As I mentioned, the period of performance for all projects begins on the date of funding. Typically, this is the surfboard award meeting in September or the July 1st new legislative start date, depending on your funding source. This is important to consider when utilizing the no match pathway. The clock starts ticking regardless of if you have your signed agreement in hand. So to help with this, planning activities qualify as reimbursable pre-agreement costs, which allows you to begin right after funding is approved. This is assuming you've met all prior statutory requirements, such as cultural resource consultation for ground disturbing activities. Next slide, please. Now I'll switch gears for a moment and quickly note the surfboard's option for monitoring projects. Limited funding is available to support regional monitoring projects on an annual basis. If you would like to propose a monitoring project, coordinate early with your local lead entity coordinator or region to learn about available funding and if your project is a good fit. 
eligible, pro eligible projects must address a high priority information need, complement ongoing monitoring, and use data collection and management protocols consistent with other monitoring occurring in the region. Next slide, please. Applicants must ask the regions to complete a regional monitoring project certification form for you to attach to PRISM with your application. Application due dates are the same as surfboard applications, but note that the surfboard monitoring panel will review the project. It's a different panel than the review panel for surfboard projects. If you have any questions about regional monitoring applications, then please contact Keith Dublanica at the Governor's Salmon Recovery Office, which is a part of the RCO. And that concludes my slides. Next up is Dave. I'm not seeing any questions. Good morning and hi everyone. I'm Dave Cadell and I'm gonna walk you through the restoration section of this presentation. So let's start it off with how we RCO define restoration in manual five. Restorations are actions or activities that restores a site to its original historic function as part of a natural ecosystem or that improves the ecological function of a site. The result of the restoration project is habitat that is self-sustaining, which means it will not require continual intervention to function as a natural ecosystem. Restoration may be accomplished as a standalone project or as part of a larger project that also focuses on other project types. Uh, restoration projects can also be phased, but each in individual phase must have a measurable salmon benefit. So for example, if you come to me and say, hey Dave, I wanna do a, a restore a relic side channel on Evans Creek, um, but I wanna do it in two phases and you explain to me that your first phase is to excavate the channel. And then the second phase will be when you connect it to Evans Creek. Uh, I'm gonna look at you and I'm gonna say, your first phase doesn't provide a salmon benefit. So you're not eligible at this point. If you can come back to me with a project that has a measurable salmon benefit, then we can go from there. So manual five is our policies and procedures manual for restoration projects. And this is where you'll find additional information about eligible restoration projects. Um, manual five is the manual I most often point sponsors to as it's kind of a one-stop shop to answers for many of your restoration questions. Um, some of the topics are eligible cost, match requirements, uh, prevailing wage, which is determined by the Department of l &I and is required if you're using state dollars. Competitive bidding and cultural resources, which uh, for restoration projects, you must complete cultural resources consultation prior to any ground disturbing activities. If you do not do so, uh, you could possibly not be reimbursed for those activities that occurred prior to completion of consultation. Um, and then there's many other topics that'll be important and relative, relevant to you during the course of your project. Things like pre-agreement costs. Um, I often get questions about um, the difference between construction cost and A and E, several things like that. So. Uh, as one of my coworkers once told me, make manuals your friends, uh, make manual five your friend. There's a lot there that is gonna be relevant to your project. Next slide. Oh, it's already there. Thank you. So just like eligible project elements, there are also ineligible project elements. Um, you can find these in manual five and also manual 18. There are several examples of ineligible project elements and therefore costs. Some of these, uh, but not limited to, are hatchery operations, uh, mandated cleanup costs, fish harvest and harvest management, 
Uh, you can't be reimbursed for developing your grant application. Uh, hatchery operations, effectiveness monitoring. There are a lot of things and it's a pretty extensive list. So please take a look. Uh, we know it takes a lot of time to put these projects together and I don't want you wasting time on something that may not be eligible for funding. Uh, ineligible project elements also applies to matching funds. If it's ineligible for reimbursement, it's ineligible for match. Next slide. Okay, now the fun part. So we're gonna look at some examples of past projects and the type of projects we fund here at RCO. On the left here, you can see a nice new bridge. We do a lot of fish passage projects. And this is basically the removal of barriers to fish passage at road crossings, but also human-made structures uh, in streams, replacing them with fish passable structures such as bridges and culverts or even better, simply removing a barrier and restoring the channel to its natural state. We do installation of fishways, which includes rough and channels. And we also do in-stream diversions and fish screens. So one of the things uh, that occurs in irrigation systems and others that divert water is fish get in, but they can't get out. So we do fish screens that will keep the fish in the, in the water, in the stream. And there's point of diversion fish screens where basically where they're connected to the stream. Then there's also uh, off stream diversions like you see on the right, even though it says in stream diversion. Um, these are usually larger systems that uh, withdraw a lot more uh, water. So we allow the fish to get in, but then we have a screen in there and a bypass to put the fish back in the stream. Uh, basically, we lose a lot of fish to these things. So these screens are really helpful, especially for uh, juvenile salmon. We also do irrigation efficiencies, uh, things like enclosing open irrigation channels and putting them into closed systems or removing diversions completely and replacing them with on-demand groundwater systems with pumps reducing the amount of water lost to evaporation or to leaky conveyance systems, uh, thereby increasing in-stream flows. Next slide. Uh, we do in-stream and floodplain habitat projects. Uh, these could include addition of large wood, uh, reconnection of side channels and floodplain habitat restoration of channels to a more natural state. If you look at the, the photo on the lower right, that's a channel restoration. Uh, the sponsor basically put in a new channel and meandered it, added wood and reconnected it to the floodplain and did a huge planting there. So we do a lot of these, it's, it's great habitat and it often removes uh, problem uh, things that are problems inside this, uh, the channel that's uh, currently there. Uh, removal of setback levees and bank revetments, and then numerous activities that enhance in-stream fish passage or fish habitat. Uh, we also do riparian habitat projects, uh, planting of native trees and shrubs, and removal and treatment of noxious weeds such as knotweed and reed canary grass. We also have a project type called rape, riparian steward, excuse me, stewardship. This project type is unique in that it provides grant funds to ensure the success of previous riparian habitat projects and activities. This project type can include some of the activities previously mentioned, but is a standalone project type that follows up on previous work to ensure the success of those previous enhancement activities. Next. Next slide, please. We do marine and nearshore projects and 
This includes estuary restoration. Uh, you can see a photo of that on the right. That is the Nisqually Delta that was restored some 15, 20 years ago. Uh, dike breach or removal. We remove bulkheads. There are a lot of bulkheads here in the sound. Reconstruction of tidal channels, uh, invasive weed control, replanting of riparian areas. Um, and then also uh, we remove non-functioning tide gates and uh, other non-fish passable structures. And if necessary, replacing them with fish passable structures. Next slide. We do upland habitat projects, uh, installation of livestock exclusion fencing, and these can be standalone projects or part of a larger restoration project. We do erosion and sediment delivery control from roads and steep slopes, uh, eliminating sediment delivery to streams, streams and marine waters. Road decommissioning and removal to help restore some of the detrimental uh, effects of roads to salmon habitat and restore natural and historic ecological function. Um, on the right there, you can see uh, a photo of a road decommissioning project. This project was done, and that's the Klickitat River. And this project was done in six phases where the project sponsor removed almost 30 miles of old logging road. So um, this is just an example of what you can do if uh, you want to do it. Um, these projects I'm showing you here are just examples of the types of projects we've seen over the years, but this is by no means an exhaustive list. Many of these activities can uh, be combined with other project types or variations of these project types you see here can be proposed for funding. These are great examples, but don't be afraid to be creative and think outside the box when developing your project. Next slide. We also have the riparian uh, planting project type. This is for projects where riparian planting is the primary purpose. This project type requires minimum buffer widths, and this is determined by the site potential tree height. Site potential tree height is the average maximum height of the tallest dominant trees, which are 200 years or old or older in the area you are planning on replanting. Why 200 years or more? Well, this is approximate minimum age of old growth forest, which are thought to be necessary for full riparian ecosystem function. If the primary purpose of your project is not riparian planting, but another eligible project type, such as in-stream restoration or fish passage, and the riparian plantings provide an ancillary benefit, the minimum planting width is not required, but it is recommended. If interested in this project type, applicants should refer to Appendix K and Manual 18 for requirements on riparian buffer planting widths. Next slide. Um, the neat thing is that if you meet the site potential tree height buffer width, you are not required to provide match. If you cannot or do not meet the site potential tree height buffer width, you will be required to provide 15% uh, in matching funds. There may be exceptions to this, and, but if you have further questions, please, ref please refer to Manual 18 or discuss it with your grant manager. Next slide, please. So some things to keep in mind. This was um, mentioned earlier, but remember for restoration projects seeking more than $350,000, you must provide at a minimum preliminary designs as part of your application. We require preliminary designs because they advance a site-specific alternative into a more detailed understanding and quantification of all the major project elements and results in design drawings and a basis of design report that meet the permit requirements for state and federal agencies. 
For more details and definitions around the various des design requirements, please see the updated project deliverables table in Appendix D located in Manual 18. Next slide. Okay, we also fund intensively monitored watershed restoration treatment projects or IMWs. These projects indicate whether restoration actions result in more salmon in the waterways in these individual watersheds. A uh, couple key differences for this project type is there is no match requirement. Uh, it requires a signed certification form from the IMW lead scientist and local region. And this is basically stating that your project will not have a, a negative effect on the current projects. And IMW needs to be included in the project title in your application. These watersheds have already been identified and you can find a table of intensively monitored watersheds in manual 18. IMW projects are submitted through the regular grant round process and follow the same timeline and uh, review. If you're considering a restoration project in an IMW, uh, please talk to your lead entity prior to submitting an application. Next slide. We also have the option of combining restoration projects with other project types, such as acquisition or planning. We call these combination projects. Uh, the combined project allows the sponsor to do what otherwise would require two separate projects, but by combining the two types into one grant, saving both time and funding. Um, applicants are unable to select a combination project from the project list in the application. So if you're considering a combination project, you'll need to ask your grant manager to select the project type for you. Inform your grant manager if you anticipate selecting one of the combination type projects listed above. And finally, uh, restoration projects can be of various scales and complexity, and this should be determined by your restoration problem and your desired outcome. Don't limit yourself, build the project you and your design team determine is the best project to restore historic processes and will provide the most significant long-term benefit to salmon. And with that, do we have any, doesn't look like anything in Q and A. So I'm gonna pass this over to Kay. Thank you. Yep, no questions. Good morning. Um, my name is Kate Caramile, and I am also a grant manager with the Salmon Recovery Funding Board. And today I'm going to talk to you about the grant application process, and then Bob Warner and I will talk about the application. So this is a general overview of the application process, but do keep in mind that your local lead entity will have additional steps in order to accommodate their local review and planning process. Now, the first thing you're going to need to do is contact your local lead entity. And the reason for that is that um, each lead entity is unique. They all have their own schedule. They all have their own process. So it's important to speak with them to ensure you know exactly what you need to do when. Now, most lead entities are going to start off requiring you to submit something called a letter of intent. And that letter of intent provides some general information about your project. And it allows the lead entity to determine whether or not they feel it's a good fit for their local sand recovery strategy. If they feel that it is, you'll be invited to submit a complete application in PRISM Online. And note that it's not gonna be a draft application, it's gonna be a full complete application that is due. That application is gonna be reviewed by your RCO grant manager, by the lead entity, as well as by the surf board review panel. And you'll be asked to attend site visits. Now, the purpose of the site visits is to provide you an opportunity to describe your project, familiarize the reviewers with your project site and the issues that are occurring there. And it's also an opportunity for the reviewers to ask questions of you to make sure that they understand what it is you're proposing and why. Now, these site visits are going to be attended by your RCO grant manager, your lead entity, and then two members of the surfboard technical review panel. But even though only two members are attending the site visits, 
they do go back um, and, and talk about all the projects together as a group and develop a comment form for each project. Now that comment form may include some general comments about your project. It might have some questions for you to answer. It might provide some recommendations for improving your project, but all the comment forms will include a project status. And the status at this point could be one of four things. Your project could be clear, meaning that they have no concerns with your project. It could be conditioned, meaning that it's clear provided you accept the condition that they propose. And a very common condition that they impose would be um, that they'd like to review and approve your preliminary designs before you move forward to developing final designs. Another status might be NMI, and that stands for need more information. And if that's your project status, it'll be followed by a list of items that they'd like you to provide. And then finally, your project status could be project of concern or POC. Um, a project of concern status means that they have very significant concerns with your, your projects, um, either its design, its benefits to salmon, or its likelihood of success. Now, if your project is cleared, you are basically done with the application process. However, do keep in mind, you may have some RCO grant manager comments to address. You may have some lead entity comments to address, and there might even be a few minor um, comments from the review panel to address, but you're done with your interaction with the review panel. If your project is not cleared, meaning that it's conditioned or it's need more information or a project of concern, in that case, you'll be invited to participate in a phone call with the review panel and the intent of that phone call is to ensure that you understand the comments that they provided and that you know how to address them. You'll then wanna submit a revised application in PRISM Online and that revised application should address all the comments you received from the review panel, the RCO grant manager, as well as the lead entity. And the review panel will then review that um, final application and they'll prepare a final comment form. And at that stage, your status will either be cleared, conditioned, or project of concern. Um, there'll no, no longer be an NMI status um, because there will no longer be any more interaction between you and the review panel. I show here that the lead into project ranking occurs after receiving that final comment form. However, in reality, it, it could occur before, during, or after. And then the surf board will approve the funding list at their board meeting in September. Note that um, projects of concern are not advanced to the surf board for consideration of funding. So as you can tell, um, there's a lot of players involved in the process. Your application is undergoing three concurrent reviews. The lead entity is looking at it to ensure that it's consistent with the local and regional strategy. They're providing some technical review of the project and they are also the ones responsible for ranking your project. Your RCO grant manager is reviewing the project application to ensure that it's eligible for funding and also that you're meeting all of the application requirements. And then finally, the RCO, I'm sorry, the surfboard technical review panel or else the monitoring panel, if this is a monitoring project, um, they're reviewing the um, technical merits of the project, specifically with regards to salmon benefits and likelihood of success. So looking at the schedule, um, as we've mentioned before, uh, each lead entity schedule is unique, but they're gonna fall under one of two tracks depending upon the timing of their site visits. So if your, um, pro your lead entity site visits occur in February or March, you fall under track one. If they occur in April or May, you fall under track two. So for instance, um, you are in a lead entity who's um, under track one, you're gonna need to complete your application by the lead entity due date. You'll then attend your site visits in February or March. You'll receive your first review panel comment form in the early spring. And then within one to two weeks, you'll be invited to participate in a conference call. And then you'll need to revise your application and submit it by the lead entity due date. And then the process starts all over again for the track two lead entities. The thing to keep in mind is that no matter which track you fall under and no matter when your final um, revised applications are due, you will not receive any final comment forms from the review panel until late July after they meet as a group. And then if your project is still conditioned at that point, um, you'll need to respond by early August as to whether or not you accept that condition, and then the surfboard will award funding in September. So 
so next, uh, Bob and I were going to go over the application, but before we do that, just wanted to see if anyone had any questions. Nope, there's nothing there um, except for one that was asked about Dave's section with the riparian buffers. If you can meet site potential tree height and that's the primary purpose of your project, then you do not have to have match. Okay, anything else? Nope. All right, thank you. So, um, if you're planning to submit a support application, I highly recommend you read section three of manual 18. Um, it provides um, all the information you need, um, very detailed description of all the application material. It's only about nine pages long. It doesn't take long and it goes over a lot more information than we're providing in this workshop alone. The lead entity website is where you can turn to to find information about your lead entity schedule, um, their application process, and then equally important is their evaluation criteria that they use to score and rank all your projects. So that's really important for you to know. The RCO website, um, that's where you're going to be able to download Manual 18, as Kat showed. You'll find Manual 3 if you're doing an acquisition project, Manual 5 if you're doing a restoration project, and all the, the application materials are there. And if you're successful in receiving a grant, this is also where you find information on managing your grant. And then lastly, I wanted to mention PRISM. Um, PRISM is the database that you'll be submitting your application, but it can also be a useful tool for you in that you can do a keyword search in order to find a project that might be similar to yours and see how previous applicants have responded to some of the questions. So that can be really helpful to you as you are trying to craft your own response. So to start your application in PRISM, you are going to need both a PRISM account as well as a Secure Access Washington account. Some folks will try to use a coworker's PRISM account, um, but this often leads to access issues later on. So it's good to just go ahead and get your own account. It doesn't take very long and you can do it right off of our website and instructions for doing it is um, in Manual 18. Once you have an account, you're gonna need a project number from PRISM. And to get that, you're gonna to wanna to speak with your lead entity coordinator. The reason I say that is that although you're going to be completing your application in PRISM Online, you need to start it in a parallel database that's known as the Salmon Recovery Portal. This used to be called the Habitat Work Schedule. So you may be familiar with it under that name. Now the Salmon Recovery Portal um, is a database that's developed for the lead entities to manage salmon recovery information within their watershed. And the reason you need to start your application there is because it creates a link between the salmon recovery portal and PRISM. And once that link is established, you only need to attach things in PRISM and they'll automatically show up in the salmon recovery portal. This is helpful for you, so you don't need to spend time attaching things to both databases. And it's also really helpful for the lead entities as well, because they have all the information they need at their fingertips. To start your application in the SAM Recovery Portal, you need some just real basic information about your project. Most lead entities are going to do this step for you and simply give you a PRISM project number to use. However, some lead entities do have you take that initial step. So that's, again, why it's important for you to speak with your lead entity coordinator to find out what you need to do. Once you have that PRISM project number, you can just go in there and complete your application. So my advice is to be thorough. Um, don't assume that the reviewers have any prior knowledge of your site, its history, or the problems that you're trying to address. Because when you're really close to a project, it's easy to forget that other people don't know what you know. And so it's important to take that step back and explain the context of your project and give the reviewers the entire story rather than just part of it. Because you can have an amazing project, um, but if the reviewers don't understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and why it's important to do that in this particular location, you're going to get a lot of questions. And that amazing project may end up being a project of concern simply because your application isn't clear. Follow the application checklist. Bob's gonna talk about this more in a minute, um, but the application checklist is 
um, provide you a complete list of, of any application material that you need to attach to PRISM. PRISM is designed to check for certain things, but it can't check for every possible attachment that you might need. So it's important for you to use this checklist and ensure you've got everything there. Don't procrastinate. Good life advice in general. Um, it's really important for your surfboard application. Your application is not a small one. There's, there's a lot of information you need to provide. Some of this information is going to require you to work with others. Um, for instance, um, if you're going to need a lander acknowledgement form for each lander that you're working with, and you're going to need their signature, they may not be around all the time. Um, you're going to need a fiscal data analysis form, so you might need to work with your billing folks to develop that. And you'll need an application authorization form, which might be need to be signed by your board, by a county commissioner, by a tribal council. Those folks may not meet very often, so you want to start this process early and not wait to the last minute. And if you need any help, um, if you uh, don't know how to use PRISM, you're not familiar with it, if you're trying to understand how to interpret some of the questions, just talk to us and um, we're happy to help you with that. Site visits, um, I've already talked about, but after your site visits, you can expect to receive comments from your RCO grant manager, the review panel, as well as from the lead entity. And because of that, you're likely going to need to update your application in response to, to their feedback. So where are you gonna find that information? On the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see all the tabs that are included in your application. And the two that are highlighted at the bottom are your um, comment tabs. So this is where you're gonna find your RCO grant manager comments under the one labeled RCO grant manager. Um, and you'll also find the surfboard review panel comments under review comments. You may find your lead entity comments under there as well. However, most lead entities are doing their comments completely outside of PRISM, but that might change over time. So the RCO grant manager comments, you don't need to respond to each of the comments, but you do need to address them all by updating your application. The surfboard review panel comments, you do need to provide a response to almost all of those. And to do that, you're going to click on the review comment tab and under each individual comment and question, there'll be a box for you to respond. Um, so it's important to include that response. And then if your response introduce any corrections or new information, you want to be sure to update the rest of your application so that it aligns with those responses and that you don't have conflicting information. Then important to submit your application by the final um, due date by the lead entity. So next we're gonna talk about some of the application material itself. And we're not gonna go over every aspect of your application, but we did wanna highlight some of the items that often trip people up. And one of these is the project description. Your project description is probably the most read portion of your application. It's used in your RCO grant agreement, it's used in press releases, our NOAA reporting, and it's probably the most visible aspect of your project to the general public. And because of that, it's very important that it be both clear and complete. You wanna be sure it answers the basic questions of who, what, where, and why. And so here's a good example from a 2020 application, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I will start off. The Mid Sound Fisheries Enhancement Group in partnership with the Kitsap Conservation District and two private landowners will complete preliminary and then final designs to restore a historic barrier embayment estuary connected to a small perennial stream. So that right there tells you who's doing the work and what they plan on doing. They then go on to talk about where the project's located. They provide a lot more information about the type of design they're working on. And then they talk about their anticipated benefits to salmon, which is the why. Now, another thing to keep in mind um, when it comes to your project description is that we receive a lot of our funding from NOAA and we need to report to NOAA on all the projects that we fund. And the only parts of the application that NOAA ever sees is the project description and your project metrics. They don't see your project proposal, they don't see your attachments or any other aspect of your project, just the project description and the metrics. And because of that, it's extremely important for the two of those to align. So your project description should mention every work type that you select in your application metrics and vice versa, your selected work types should reflect everything that you mention in your project description. 
As we grant managers review your application, if we see any discrepancies, we'll likely return your application for you to make corrections. The project proposal, this used to be a separate attachment in PRISM, but in 2020, we merged it into PRISM itself. So now you'll, you'll answer all the questions directly in PRISM. And keep in mind that it's still your, your sales pitch. This is still where you're gonna provide all the information for reviewers to understand what you plan on doing and why it's important. The points I wanted to point out here is that each of your responses has a character limit. And if you see the, the circle in the lower right-hand corner, um, this is a response to question number one. It says description is required, zero of 3,000 characters. That means that for this particular response, you have up to 3,000 characters to answer it. Um, as soon as you hit that 3,000, PRISM is going to cut you off and won't allow you to enter anything more. So pay close attention to those character limits. And another thing that you might find helpful, especially if you're working as part of a team, is that you can actually download all of the questions um, in your PRISM application um, from our website as a Word document. And you may find that really helpful to be able to work offline as a team, craft your response, and once you're done, you can simply cut and paste those responses directly into PRISM. If you're doing that, um, then you need to pay even extra special attention to those character limits. Because it's really easy to cut and paste and walk away and not realize that PRISM only saved a portion of your response. So you'll wanna cut, paste, save it, and then look at your response to make sure it's not cut off. So one of the things we hear most often from the review panel is that projects need very clear goals and objectives. Now these goals and objectives are not only important to the review panel, but they are important to you and your design team as well because they help you make design decisions and they allow you to evaluate your project success. Now PRISM provides some example goals and objectives for each um, different project type. Um, they also provide a link to the Stream Habitat Restoration Guidelines where you can find additional information on how to craft your goals and objectives. But the thing to keep in mind for a goal is that it's not what you plan to do, but what you expect to accomplish by doing it. It's the desired outcome and the species and life stages that will benefit. So an example goal, um, it shouldn't be to install five log jams in a stream. Your goal might instead be to reconnect the floodplain along a half mile of stream to increase the overwintering habitat for juvenile steelhead. Those five log jams that you're installing, that's just the tool you're using to achieve that goal. It's not the goal itself. Now objectives, they support and refine your goals and they break them into smaller steps. Again, we provide some examples um, in PRISM. Your objectives should be quote unquote smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So an example objective to the goal that I just mentioned might be to increase the flood prone area within the project reach by three acres at the two year flow event by 2026. Next, I'm gonna turn things over to Bob. Hi everybody, I'm Bob Warner. I'm one of the newer outdoor grant managers at RCO, and I'm going to talk about how your project is set up for tracking in PRISM and some of the attachments that are required with your application. So work sites and properties are important building blocks of your application. They affect how you will represent a project's metrics and costs and ultimately the reimbursement process because you'll need to track and report your costs by work site or property. The work site in PRISM tracks the geologic or I'm sorry, geographic location of your project. Every project requires at least one work site, and with the exception of certain broad scale assessments, every work site requires at least one property. You want to have a separate property for each landowner. The number of work sites to include is not always clear. If you're doing a simple activity on one landowner's property, the answer is simple one, one work site and one property. If you're doing a single activity that encompasses multiple adjacent land, landowner properties, it makes sense to have a single work site with multiple properties with each property representing a different landowner. 
Due to requirements with RCO's federal funders, if you're proposing work on geographically distinct areas more than a half mile apart, you should create separate work sites for those areas. And each work site should have a separate property, even if it's the same landowner. If work areas are closer than a half mile, but not adjacent, talk with your grant manager so we can help you craft uh, the best scenario um, with the setup in PRISM. It's easier to set it up right at the beginning than to restructure your application or process an amendment to change it later. Keep in mind that for restoration and design projects, you'll need to track and report costs separately for each work site. For acquisition projects, you'll need to track and report costs separately for each property. Next slide, please. So work types reflect the work you plan to complete and determine which metrics RCO will collect. You wanna select the work types that best fit your project. And remember that work types are not always related to just on the ground work. People sometimes forget to put cultural resources and permitting or admin and engineering in the budget. So, be, so carefully consider your project costs and select everything you plan to bill RCO for reimbursement. So RCO, we use uh, metrics for all sorts of things. Um, we use them to track project completion. Um, NOAA, who provides federal funds for surfboard, uses them to report to Congress. They're used uh, in the bi biennial state of salmon report. They're used by lead entities to track recovery progress and by RCO to help answer questions from legislators. And researchers sometimes mine our database for information. So for metrics do matter, so you got to be careful um, to make sure and accurately uh, document those. For acquisition projects, most work types are reported at the property level. The three main groups are land, incident, incidentals, and administration. So land metrics are straightforward. For instance, the type of protection the acquisition is, is uh, achieving and also like the amount of acres uh, acquired. Incidentals are the largest group of metrics here, and they can include cultural resources, appraisals, closing costs, demolition, and, and lots of other things. Administration is your staff time and the cost of administrating the project and grant. Next slide, please. For restoration projects, work types and metrics are reported at the work site level. In general, the metrics can be more complicated for restoration projects, and there are a large number of, number of potential work types from which to choose. The important thing to consider when choosing metrics is what best reflects what you are doing. For instance, if fish passage is the main goal and you're planting just the area disturbed from construction activities, you would select fish passage, but not riparian planting. Um, if you had a project restoring fish pass passage plus, you're doing 200, a 200 foot buffer along a quarter mile of stream, you would select fish passage and riparian planting for two different work types. Please work with your lead entity coordinator and your grants manager if you wanna, if you have any questions about, about this. Once you select a work type, you'll be asked to enter costs and metrics associated with that work type. Think forward to what your project will cost at the time of construction, because the, the cost could change by then with inflation and other things. Also, if you're uncertain of the exact number to use in metrics, be conservative. It's better to guess low and deliver high than to guess high and deliver low. We'll provide a visual review of application metrics during the live PRISM demonstration later in this presentation. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to discuss the most common types of attachments you, you must, must provide with your application. I'm not gonna cover every possible attachment. So be sure to review the attachment required for your project in manual 18 and in the application checklist that you can find in appendix C. Next slide, please. You'll need to obtain a landowner acknowledgement form as part of your complete application. This form is signed by a landowner and simply acknowledges that they are aware of the project that you're applying for is on their land. This is not a legal binding co contract and it does not require any 
future participation by the landowner. If you have a restoration project and the project is funded, you will need to obtain a signed landowner agreement. For all landowners who, whose property involves restoration activities on their property, prior to starting the construction on their property. The landowner agreement commits the landowner, landowner to the project for 10 years and identifies monitoring and maintenance requirements. In some cases, you may have a landowner that is only temporarily involved. For example, if they're just granting um, access to the project during construction or something like that. In these cases, a landowner acknowledgement form is needed, but you don't need the landowner agreement. Exceptions to the landowner acknowledgement form and the landowner agreement form occur when you're proposing a project on your own property. Assessments, inventories, and studies that cover, cover a large area and encompass numerous properties do not require landowner acknowledgement forms. Multi-site acquisition projects that involve a large group of landowners require at minimum signed landowner acknowledgement forms for the, for the priority parcels um, within your uh, project um, envelope. If your project is owned, uh, located on state-owned aquatic lands, the landowner acknowledgement form is signed by DNR. Next slide, please. Every surfboard app application requires at least three maps, a vicinity level map, a project level map, and an area of potential effect or APE map. Vicinity maps should show where the project is located from recognizable, recognizable regional perspective. And this is actually pretty much covered now in uh, the mapping feature of PRISM when you apply for your, when you uh, insert your application. The project level map or site plan should be zoomed in to show enough detail to envision restoration, design, or acquisition elements. In some cases, you may need to provide more than one map to represent the whole project. To help maps, to help make maps more consistent and easier for evaluation, include the following on your map. Project name or project number, sponsor name or logo, a north arrow, labeled streams and an arrow indicating flow direction, a map scale, and label any other identifying lab, uh, landmarkers such as roads or water bodies. For acquisition, clearly designate parcels using legal parcel layers and include landowner names or other identifying information if there are more than one parcel. Next slide, please. Attach all supporting documents such as assessments, designs, and design reports from previous phases. This helps to provide a context and understanding of the goals, objectives, and design considerations of the project. This is especially helpful if you have a large multi-phase restoration project. We recognize that some projects may be very conceptual at the time of application. If so, include sketches, example designs, and photos from other projects. Anything to help convey your intent to for, to the review panel and to the surfboard. The key is to make your intent clear. More is better here. Error on the side of providing too much information than, than uh, possibly missing something in your application. And again, for the fourth time in this presentation, if you apply for uh, greater than $350,000 in restoration funding, RCA requires a preliminary design that it, for uh, an application deliverable. This includes engineered drawings, and a design report. Please see Manual 18's Appendix D for detail on what's required as a for a preliminary design or contact your grant manager. Next slide, please. The cost estimate worksheet provides technical reviewers and grant managers a detailed overview of your project budget above and beyond what is in the PRISM application. It is important that you don't undercut your project. Part of being ready to, to proceed with your project means that you have worked out a reasonable cost estimate, taking into account all costs. Project evaluators will look at your project to determine if you've included enough in your cost estimate to complete the project. Including all costs ensures your project is well thought out. And there's been several projects in my experience where you'll look at it and you'll determine that there just is not enough money there to complete a project, and that can be a real detriment to, to your project during review. Make sure you have all costs included on your cost estimate. For instance, labor and materials should be separate costs. Project man man 
management and permits and, sur uh, and surveys should be individual line items. Different design phases should be called out and itemized for their tasks and deliverables. For admin, architectural, and engineering costs, also known as AA and E, break out the various admin and design costs by staff, consultant, and task. If your project is eligible for indirect costs, add those to the section specifically provided for indirect costs below the a &E section. We recommend you consider using the surfboard cost estimate te template provided on the website. It provides many useful categories and it automatically shows if you exceeded your A&E allowance and compiles all project types into a well-organized total page. Next slide, please. Sometimes applicants of large projects may choose to not show their entire project match in PRISM to ease billing and provide flexibility. This is fine. However, it is important to communicate the total project cost. The cost estimate worksheet provides a column for you to show this un additional unreported cost. Next slide, please. When putting together your budget, keep in mind the allowable limits of A&E and administration costs. A&E costs are architectural and engineering expenses incurred for restoration grants, but also include direct costs associated with managing the project. The surfboard limits these costs to 30% of the overall construction budget. Please consider if you request funding for a restoration project and have already completed a considerable amount of design work, a full 30% request may be scrutinized more closely. Make sure to provide as much detail with your A&E budget as you do with your construction budget. Admin, admin refers to administrative costs associated with land acquisition. This includes staff time managing the project, contracting and reviewing incidentals, and legal fees. This is limited to 5% of the land class plus incidental costs for each project or each property. Next slide, please. The authorizing application form requires a sponsor's governing organization to specify and approve through resolution who is the signing authority for official documents associated with RCL surfboard grants, such as agreements and amendments. Due to the time it can take to organize a meeting for formal resolution with your governing board, it is important to not procrastinate on this form. Not completing this form on time could potentially lead to an Ill, in, Ill, 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 ineligible application. This is not required for tribes, so please reach out to your grant manager for questions about that. Next slide, please. Finally, all applications must include a fiscal data collection sheet. RCO uses this form for financial and federal reporting. This form provides information regarding the indirect rate you intend to use for your surfboard grant and fed if your surfboard grant has federal funds. Uh, recent financial audits of your organization, and general financial information for your organization. Typically, this type of information is housed with your bookkeeping staff or accountant. So plan in time. So plan for the time it takes to acquire this information and don't procrastinate again. Okay, great. So next up is uh, the section on grant requirements. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Bob. Um, so I didn't see any questions. And before I begin, I wanted to make a small correction to Bob's uh, section. He mentioned in the required map section that um, APE maps are a required attachment. And actually now we have a mapping tool in the application on the cultural resources page where you draw your area of potential effect. So you no longer are required to attach an APE map separately. You might find instances where you need to uh, attach another map for information. Your APE might be large or um, you just want to provide additional details, but it's not a, a required attachment anymore. Anyway, um, my name is Alice Rubin and I'm a senior grant manager. And this is the last por portion of the slideshow where I'll cover some active project items that are important to understand for your application. And after that, I'll do a live demo of PRISM. So 
I should be able to finish my presentation portion before noon. And um, I apologize for the time. And if you want to stick around and see a live PRISM demo, I invite you to stay a little bit longer. Next slide, please. In general, MATCH is a required budget element. It is a sponsored share of the project costs. To understand what can be used as match, the rule of thumb, if the cost would be eligible for grant reimbursement, then it is also eligible as match. The match amount and percentage in the project's PRISM budget at final application is entered into your project agreement. The percentage match in your agreement is applied in your project billings on a cumulative basis. PRISM will hold some of your build costs to maintain the project match percentage, unless you have also documented enough match in your bills to account for the cumulative reimbursement amount requested. Next slide. The minimum surfboard project match requirement is 15% of the total project costs in PRISM. Some lead entities have additional rules around match or may have more potential points for project ranking if you bring an additional match. So be sure to refer to the local rules and score scoring criteria. There are a few exceptions where required match for your project might be different from the standard rate, as we've mentioned um, before in the presentation. This includes design projects, IMW restoration projects, riparian planting projects that meet site potential tree height, and acquisition projects with high ratio of uplands. And again, if your project falls into one of these categories, work with your grant manager to ensure the project match in your application is adjusted accordingly. Next slide. There are five different match categories in PRISM listed in the left column on this slide. Now there are some nuances in these categories. For example, if sponsor staff time might go um, into different match categories based on how the time is paid. If you have another grant helping pay for project costs, staff time paid using that other grant would go into either the state funding or monetary funding category. But if you are paying staff time from your force account, then that would be categorized as donated paid labor. Please note the items listed as an eligible match. Mitigation funds specifically refers to required mitigation actions from an activity outside of the project. If your project permit requires some mitigation, that would be eligible if it's within the project footprint. Next, please. There are a few things you should understand about incurring project costs and getting paid. Sponsors should pay for project costs first. You only bill RCO for costs that you have paid, and RCO reimburses you for those payments. Surfboard allows sponsors to request cash advances. We have strict rules for this service, so please make sure to read Manual 8, which is our billing manual, to understand these rules and expectations. Outside of cash advances, we can also pay for land acquisition via escrow before closing. This is a different process than a cash advance request. Make sure you work with your grant manager to ensure you provide the required documentation and submit the escrow billing within the necessary timeframe before closing. Certain pre-construction costs incurred prior to project funding date could be eligible for reimbursement, as long as you get approval from RCO. Refer to Manual 18 for a complete list of eligible pre-agreement costs. And I'll reiterate here, if you need to purchase land before funding is awarded, make sure you get a waiver of retroactivity at least a month before closing. Next slide, please. If your project is on public property, you should contact staff from the land owning agency early in the planning process. It's important to ensure restoration actions are compatible with other, other required land uses for the property, and you will be allowed to implement your proposed work. All applicants working on public lands, including agency staff, should make sure to talk to the agency's land management team. These staff are the experts and will be able to advise on title encumbrances or other restrictions on the property. These 
land use restrictions could interfere with project implementation. Next slide. We covered this, so I apologize for a, a little redundancy, but just as a reminder, if your project includes in-water work, you need to coordinate with DNR to determine if you are working on state-owned aquatic lands. Um, if your project is on state-owned aquatic lands, you'll need to get DNR to sign our land owner acknowledgement form, as mentioned before, uh, before the application deadline. We encourage you to start this early. If your project is funded, DNR will require you to get their land use authorization in advance of restoration. This authorization generally takes the place of surfboards landowner agreement. Next slide, please. Excuse me. Next, it's important for you to understand how cultural resources review requirements might impact your project scope and budget. In our work, it is important to remember that rivers, shorelines, and estuaries are, are areas of significant, and cu significant cultural and historical use that contain valuable and irreplaceable cultural and historical resources. Now, we often talk about cultural resources, but we're really referring to both cultural and historic resources, and both are protected by state and federal law. Cultural and historic items are fragile and non-renewable. They contain valuable information about the people who lived before us. Typical prehistoric sites or materials include shell middens, pictographs or petroglyphs, culturally modified trees, burial sites, and stone tools. Historical resources include homesteads, farmsteads, mining sites, or other structures and artifacts more than 50 years old of significance. Now, not all structures 50 years old or older are historically significant. However, you may be asked to evaluate older structures in your project area to make that determination before you can begin work. Compliance with cultural resources consultation and mitigation can incur significant costs. Recently, RCO has tried to provide early information to applicants regarding potential cultural resources review requirements to help you plan and budget accordingly. Next slide, please. The cultural resources review process requires consultation led by a state or federal agency. The agency lead contacts the Washington Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation and affected Native American tribes. RCO will help sponsors determine who leads the consultation process to understand how to proceed. Each funded project will have a special condition that explains next steps required to meet cultural resources review consultation. Sponsors cannot proceed with ground disturbing actions until a cultural resources consultation is complete. Now be advised, this also includes planning actions such as geotechnical surveys. Sponsors could be asked to conduct a cultural resources survey, have an archeologist monitor on site, mitigate any effects, obtain a special per permit, or have an inadvertent discovery plan. As I mentioned, these tests can have significant costs. So please be sure to plan ahead to include budget for staff time and other potential consultation costs and use the information provided by RCO in the early application process to help plan project costs and your project schedule. Next slide. Now, once your project is funded, it's important that you remember not to break ground or begin construction until you've secured site control and tenure with a landowner agreement if you're not the property owner. Uh, that con cultural resources consultation is complete and that permits are in hand. RCO cannot reimburse for any restoration work until all these steps are complete. Also, any restoration work done prior to funding approval is ineligible for reimbursement or to be used as match. Next slide. Okay, that's it. Um, this concludes the PowerPoint portion of the workshop. So thank you. I have six minutes uh, to demo PRISM, but I wanna pause and see if there were any questions.
There was one about the APE map, um, whether you could choose an attachment for an APE or um, whether it needs to be mapped in the application. It does need to be mapped within the application and you can upload shape files to help with that if you have those accessible and um, it's pretty handy that way. Um, if you wanted to add any other additional information or maps regarding the APE, those could be attached, but they would be in addition to the mapped um, portion within the PRISM application. Thanks, Alyssa. And if you all didn't um, catch the message throughout the presentation, we really encourage you to look at Manual 18. I mean, this presentation was um, had a lot of information, but there's still even more that we couldn't cover. So Manual 18 is a really useful resource as you prepare your application and manage your funded projects. And the other manuals mentioned, Manual 3 for acquisition, Manual 5 for restoration, Manual 8 for billing. And I will show you on our website um, where those are where you can access those. So you don't have to try to figure it out on your own. Um, and make sure you contact your lead entity coordinators and become familiar with the lead entity processes as well because they, the state process and the local process, the lead entity process um, are married together. And of course, if you have any questions, please reach out to any of the Salmon grant managers. We're really happy to help you with anything, with any additional questions that come up as you work on your applications. And now. Hey, Alice. Yes, thanks, Mark. Go ahead. Can I put in a quick plug for our Salmon conference before you go to the demo? Yeah, you can do that while I'm getting set up. Sweet. Hey everybody, uh, thank you for participating with us. We all look forward to seeing many of you around the state at our application site visits, but I just wanted to remind you that our ninth biennial salmon conference is this April in Vancouver, Washington. It's in person. The, the theme of the conference is a shared future. You can get on the RCO website that Alice has up right here. Go to the search, just type in salmon conference and you can register now. Um, and now here's your pro tip. If you have an active surfboard grant and your existing A&E or admin budget has a little bit of room in it, you can pay for the costs of attending the conference. We're not going to give you a cost increase. We're not giving you more money. But if you have an active grant and you have a little bit of room in your A&E or admin budget, you could pay for the uh, conference, pay for your hotel costs. Uh, you're pretty in for food. Anyways, April 18th and 19th in Vancouver. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Mark. And if you all were watching, I actually demoed that suggestion from Mark. We have a search bar on our website with a little magnifying glass. And you saw I just typed in Salmon Conference and it popped up at the top. You can just click it. That's an easy way to find it. So I, I did want to show you some um, features of our website really quickly before I jump into PRISM demo. Our website is rco.wa.gov, pretty straightforward. Um, the, uh, about five years ago, we changed our website, so hopefully most of you know how to navigate, but just in case, all of these are little drop downs once you hover over them. For your purposes, the grant section will be the most useful, I believe. As you can see, all of our grant programs are listed alphabetically by um, acronym. So you can see that Sam and PSAR is here. But in this left area, there's also <laughs> a lot of helpful um, tools. So um, I, we're probably beyond grants overview and find a grant because you already know what uh, that you want to apply for salmon. So when, so I suggest you start with apply for a grant. And this is where um, there is instruction on um, getting a secure uh, Access Washington account and a PRISM account. But I wanted to show you the PRISM page, which is really useful if you're not very well acquainted with PRISM. Again, you can create a PRISM account you can log on from here or um, you can reset your password, which is actually kind of moot now that we have Secure Access Washington. You don't really have to worry about that button.
But anyway, if you scroll down, uh, we have this really nice section about attachments and all the different types of attachments that can be added to PRISM and their size limits. So sometimes we run into size limits with our attachments. So if you're trying to figure that out, you can find that here. And if you scroll a little bit further down, we have some really nice training videos based on what you're trying to do, e-billing, progress reporting, um, mapping properties, and um, our PRISM help desk email is here. And if you're having technical issues with PRISM, shoot them an email and they will respond to you probably within an hour or two. They're really quick and they're extremely, extremely helpful. So I really encourage you to use the PRISM help desk email. Okay. We also have, um, Bridget mentioned this, if you go into grant requirements, that's where our acquisition toolkit can be found. Um, these other sections here apply more to recreation projects, so you don't need to um, really dive into those. We have a new page that talks more about cultural resources and has some really helpful cultural resources resources for you. So if you haven't gone to that page yet and you're always finding yourself with a little with some additional questions about cultural resources, you can look here and a grant manuals page. So you can just go here and it's a direct link to all of our grant manuals, all the ones that we talked about and grant manuals for all of the other programs offered at RCO. So you can see we've got 20, 26 manuals. So you can really dive into RCO programs. So I'm going to show you, this is the surfboard PSAR um, page. If you, I mean, I had it open, but this is what opens when you click here. And this, if you click on this button, that's manual 18. And here's our grant schedule for the state, if you uh, scroll down. And on the right here, these are all the forms that we discussed today and probably then some. And I would re encourage you to always come to this website to get the forms because um, if they get updated, they'll, you'll have the most recent form from the website. It's really important that you use the most current form because sometimes we have to, to change them for required data that we need for, from updates from the feds or just updated requirements from the legislature or for our programs in general. So please make sure you get the current forms from our website. And one more thing I wanted to show you, of course, you can uh, explore as much as you want. But these are navigation buttons. And if you click the bottom one, it's Salmon Resources, it'll jump down the page. And along with the workshops, it has the individual attachments. Um, I think Josh had a, a picture of this section of the web page, and that's pretty um, handy. We have Appendix D separately, and we encourage you if you have a design project and you plan on hiring a consultant, that you click on Appendix D here and download the PDF of the appendix and give it, you know, put it in your bid package, give it directly to your design team. So they know exactly what items you're gonna be asked to submit with your design. Okay, now, Prism demo. Oh, 1203, I was so close. So, um, I'm going to go here. This link for PRISM login is at the top of the entire website. So no matter where you are on the website, you can log into PRISM. You can probably see that uh, I've got PRISM bookmarked. So this is Secure Access Washington and I'm going to enter, oops, my personal login. And hopefully I can type correctly. And so once you've signed in the first time through Secure Access Washington and connected it to PRISM, anytime you click on that PRISM link to log in, it will take you directly to PRISM. So that's pretty nice. This is PRISM. Um, this is what you'll see. You can uh, type in your project number here. You 
for applications, you can click on the application button and it'll set up or list all the applications that you're listed under. And I uh, set up a special application to demo for today just for inf informational purposes. So this is what the PRISM application looks like. You've got your project number, the project type, and the project name at the top of every page. This is, these are all the application pages. So I've made a combination acquisition planning and restoration project. So it has a couple of extra pages that not you won't see in every application. The application is built especially for the program and the project type that um, you have. So in PRISM, make sure you save. Uh, PRISM will time out after a certain amount of inactivity. So if you get a phone call, if you go to lunch and you're working on your application, hit the save button real quick, just to make sure you don't lose any of your data. The next way you can save is by hitting the next button. So when you hit the next button, it will have saved whatever you entered in the previous page. So contacts page, you can add contacts. Um, your, you should already, your application should already have your lead entity coordinator and your grant manager preloaded on this page, but you should add anybody who will be uh, working on the application here. Uh, include billing contacts too, because they'll this will roll into your active project when you're funded. You can um, change your project name if you want to. Bob talked about work sites and properties. So this is where you build that. You add work sites and you you name your work site and you add your properties and you name your properties. But this is an important page if you have a combination, if you have a combination project, because you'll be asked, especially for acquisition combo projects, you need to indicate the action that will occur on the property. So this property is only going to have a restoration action. This property is only, only going to be acquired. Uh, work site details. This is where you drop your pins. Um, this one, <laughs> I used an old application. So it has driving instructions, but you actually are required to drop the little numbers in. The, the little car dots are not required. So this is the work site location and you can see it's by work site. And you need to pay attention if you have multiple work sites because a lot of sections in the application are divided by work sites. So you need to make sure you understand details about each of your work sites, like all of the act actions you're planning on your work sites, the unique properties of your work sites, so you can describe them appropriately in the application. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead. A lot of these um, pages are self-explanatory. Uh, so staff, <laughs> if somebody asks about one of these pages that I'm skipping, please interrupt me and I'll go back. But see, so I'm skipping forward to a page and I didn't save. So if you cl click through the navigation bar, instead of using next, You'll, you will get a pop-up that says you haven't saved yet. So that's nice, but PRISM won't give you a pop-up if, if you're inactive. So that's a little tip about saving. And I'm gonna say, okay, cause this is just a demo. And here is the description that Kay reviewed and you can see in the character count here, it does change as you type. Now the proposal questions are set up for the entire project. So be sure if you need to, you discuss, discuss unique features or unique questions by work site. So the reviewers, both the surfboard reviewers, our state review panel, and your local lead entity reviewers understand the conditions and what you're trying to do on each work site. You can see we have some options for um, editing in some of these questions. So you can bold, italicize, you can use some numbers or bullets. And that's helpful because of the limited characters. So you can, you know, use these tools to help be um, efficient with the character count. All of these questions are expandable and contractable. So click on the carrot 
and it'll hide your text. So if it gets really wordy, that's nice. Um, so you don't have so much to be looking at as you're working on each question. You can see as I collapsed everything, we've got some helpful links. Or if the question is longer than the, the minimum or the maximum character count for display, you can click the more to make sure you're answering the question. And make sure you're answering the questions. Um, I think a lot of us get into autopilot and you're excited to tell the story about your project and you start answering a question that's um, further down in the proposal versus what the, versus the question you're answering. So we get a lot of feedback sometimes on redundancy of our questions. And in my experience, it's because um, you've provided more information than what is being asked. And that's, I, I understand, you know, we understand um, you're trying to tell your story and you, you, a lot of you have done this for a long time. So you get, you already have a feeling or an understanding of the workflow of the questions. But if you're finding like you're saying the same thing over and over again, reread the question and say, is that actually the problem statement or am I getting into the scope of work now? Maybe I need to cut and paste and move that section to the a different question and I'm not answering the question here. And that's also important to remember if you're um, hitting your character limit. You might be you know, just providing information that is asked in a different question. So um, each project type has supplemental questions. And I wanted to show you um, each section and highlight some newer questions that we've built. So um, we ask about um, public access. And it's important to tell us how you uh, mean to manage public access. Technically, public access is required for all of the projects that are paid for by RCO. Um, but you can have some access um, techniques. It doesn't, you don't have to build a park for everybody. So if you want to manage public access, we, we want to know. We have a question about geographic envelope that that covers what Bridget was talking about in, um, in the acquisition section of the questions. And uh, we have a new question about upland acreage. So this is where you tell us if you're if you have more than 50% uplands, and we'll try to pay attention to this as we as grant managers as when we review your application to see if we need to adjust the match as previously discussed. But it is helpful if you give us a heads up if you um, need a greater match for your project because your uplands are a higher ratio than 50%. So in the planning and restoration supplemental questions, I just wanted to highlight these first two questions these are restoration supplemental questions. So if you have any uh, restoration project, you'll see these. We want to know if you have an assessment. And if you do, you get additional questions. And these are bulleted items that are required to be met that are also outlined in Manual 18. So we're asking you directly are you, to know if you've, you know, if you're meeting those required items to be able to have an assessment project. We also are asking about levels of design. First, what you'll have at the time of application, so we know what we'll, be, what we'll see in the attachments. So if you have any level of design that's ready by the application due date that you've indicated here, you need to add them to your project attachments. Then we're asking, you know, what, this is basically like what design deliverables will be in your funded project. So if you, intend to go beyond what you've listed in the first drop down, you'll have to indicate it in the second drop down. And then we ask if you choose preliminary design or field fit, if you have you know specific a specific um, 
design process that doesn't match with Appendix D and what final deliverables we should expect from your design process before you go to restoration. Metrics. So I guess I'm going to review metrics because Bob said I would. <laughs> so you can see we've got acquisition metrics because we have an acquisition element and we've got planning and restoration metrics because we have planning and restoration elements of the project. So um, each project type has their own specific metrics based on the activities that you plan to do. So make sure you check off if you're going to do an easement or purchase property. And then tell us what incidentals you plan to include that are part of your budget and plan to implement. We do have in required incidentals in order to acquire a property, including appraisal, appraisal review, <clears throat> you know, you'll want closing costs. So you might get a comment from your grant manager saying, I'm getting some background noise, Mark. Um, so your grant manager might catch that you missed one of our required incidentals. So somebody might ask you, hey, is RCO going to pay for this incidental? Is your match going to cover it? We just want to make sure that you've budgeted for all of your required incidentals. So just a heads up. And administrative costs. So you can see that's at the bottom of the list. So don't miss it if you need administrative costs. Oh, come on, Prism. See, I get slow. I have to wait for Prism too. I know a lot of you talk about the spinning wheel and we get it to a staff so we can relate. So um, th this is the restoration metrics and planning metrics page. We have what we call project level metrics at the top here. So any um, metrics you put in this top section should cover the entirety, the entire footprint of the project. So if you have sub, if anything in the metrics below this top section, you can are larger than this, what you've indicated here, your grant manager is gonna ask you because they don't align. The only um, exception to that is riparian planting because your riparian planting could be double the, the miles of stream because you might be planting both sides of the stream. So make sure your footprint that you put here is representative for the work site that um, you're reporting. We've got all of our categories. Oh, excuse this quick scrolling. You can collapse everything. Let's see here. Oh, look at that. So you can, I hit collapse and all the categories collapsed, which is nice when you're starting out because you can scroll to the topic that you are trying to get to quickly. And you can see, um, you know, you can see all the different category, restoration categories you can choose from. And again, cultural resources, permitting, a and E indirect are at the bottom of the list. So it's really important to scroll all the way to the bottom of the list of each work site. We have some acquisition metrics too. Okay. Okay, sorry, I know. I'm so the cost estimates pages are really handy because you can see just the costs that you entered on those metrics pages and make sure that it aligns with your budget. So I encourage you to look at those and review those. I like this one for planning and restoration projects because you can actually edit the budget items that you added in the metrics pages and or the metrics page and it will it will change what's on the metric page. So if you find something is incorrect, you can correct it here and not have to sift through the restoration page, metrics page. Cost hmm. summary, I just want to point out the funding program amount is your grant request. And um, we tell you the percentage 
that your grant request is. And most projects will be 85% if you have 15% match. We have six decimal points here because our agency uses six decimal points. It's what's significant. Um, so make sure it's not over 85%. You literally cannot go 80, over 85% if your match is 15%. And here's where you tell us your match sources. So you'll add match. And in this first dropdown, these are the five categories I um, covered. And state funding is for our other RCO programs. So we have them automatically listed here. So you could select them. So once you've done that, you, you click add match and it'll uh, populate the rest. And this is where you tell us how much match WICRI is um, providing. And then uh, funding organization, then you could just say RCO and it'll pop up. So if you're not sure, um, we have some definitions in manual eight to help you understand what goes into each category or you could ask your grant manager. And like I, as you saw, like we have pre-populated the match type so that can help you too. If you're not sure, you could click on one and see what the match type tells you and help you. I should just use the next button so I don't get that pop up. So here is the cultural resources page. And this is what I was referring to previously um, about the APE map. You can see this map at the top. Um, it's got parcels already populated. You can turn that off by clicking the, paper, the sheet icon. You can change your um, layer, your base layer here. To draw your map, you have to click full screen map. Also, we have a tutorial video here. So if you haven't drawn an APE map before and can't remember how to do it, or you're not sure, this, this tutorial is less than 10 minutes it's, and it's really uh, helpful. So you'll click on the full screen map. A new tab opens. So here's my application and here's my APE map. Wow. Again, these are the layers. I think the parcels are automatically turned on if you have an acquisition project and it jumps to where your work sites were mapped. So that's another reason why you have to drag those dots to the map on the early page. I think it's work site details page. So it's really helpful because it already takes you to like where you're trying to go. Um, you can turn off and on layers that you like or don't like. You can change your base map to whatever you like. If you like streets, it'll change. So zoom in. To draw, click the pencil button and you get this open, a new window open. You can either draw on the map or upload a shape file. I'm not gonna upload a shape file but it has additional instruction. Click the back button, draw on the map. We want you to draw a polygon. Our projects are not lines and they are not dots. They are areas. So you can choose the type of polygon you want to draw. It's probably best to avoid a circle because a circle is not specific. <laughs> It's just a circle. Very rarely will our project areas be circular. So it's highly recommended that you try to outline the boundary of your project area. Press down and let go. Okay, so hold your button down, hold your mouse button down. That's what I will do. It's very important that you try to draw the specific boundaries of your project area for the cultural resources team to understand the area of disturbance. You need to name your shape and you need to select a work site. We have check boxes here for um, additional information. So click okay. Okay, so this says saving map, but you can navigate back and leave that open if you want to. Ooh. I didn't want that. 
And now you can see my restoration area has been drawn. We have questions that you need to answer as well by worksite because we understand that sometimes the same actions aren't done on each worksite. This, um, this polygon isn't drawn very well because we would like for you to draw polygons that are that overlap are, are contiguous to your fork site dot. Just so make sure you do that. I'm not being very good um, applicant, which is probably a good reason why I'm a grant manager. So please make sure if um, if you need to move your work site location down to where you drew your um, APE. And again, that's on the worksite details page. It's really important to be as specific as possible when you answer these questions and answer the questions for the application that you are submitting. If you have future um, projects, if this is a design only project, we only wanna know about your design actions because we're only consulting on the project that we're funding. So um, we have a question about if you need a federal permit. Well, you might be like, yeah, I'll need a federal permit when I restore. But if you're not, if you're not applying for permits in your design project, say no, because that's not gonna be included in your project scope. So focus on the project scope and be as specific as possible. Our cultural resources team uses the answers to these questions to help with those early review recommendations. And also when we actually initiate cultural resources consultation. Um, permits are pretty straightforward. Add a permit. Again, you have to add a permit even if you're not going to have any permits. We have a none. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's the attachments page. Click this button. You can drag and drop. You can browse, you can add multiple attachments at once and then upload them all at the same time. Um, the bigger the attachment, I would suggest uploading it individually. We have size limits, Prism can be slow. So if you know you have a large design, you might wanna do that separately from like your photos and your maps. Uh, we have attachment types. The attachment types here correspond with the uh, required attachments above. So there's not a type that's say that's indicated as cost estimate in this application. And we don't have an item that's RCO fiscal data collection sheet. If you, I'm just gonna use this for the demo. You can see we have an RCO fiscal data collection sheet um, if I save this, that checkbox is going to check. Now, remember, we advise you to look at Appendix C, which lists all of your required uh, application elements. This checklist is not complete because we have some attachments that are required only for certain types of projects. So if you have a barrier project, you will be required to include a barrier, a WDFW barrier form. Well, we just don't have that listed here because it's only for one specific project type. So please make sure you use that um, checklist as your guide to make sure you get all your required attachments. And to submit your application, you have to check your application for errors. So PRISM reads through all of the fields and sees if there's any blanks. Obviously my application could not be submitted. I've got a lot of red exclamation points and that indicates that your page is not complete. If you get all green check marks, then you can click the check button and then you can hit submit. Applications, the submission deadline for the first, the first submission deadline is at least two weeks before your lead entity site visit. Check your lead entity calendar. They dictate that application due date. So it's not necessarily two weeks. Some of them might be three weeks before the site visit. So that's it's really important to know what that deadline is when you have to submit your complete application. And Kay mentioned the comments pages. Now this, 
this application isn't set up for comments, so I apologize. But when you go to this page, there will be a tab here for lead entity comments. So if your lead entity utilizes the um, PRISM comment form, you'll find them here. And then you'll have a tab for early comments from the state review panel. And then if you have a POC and needs more information or can, yeah. You know, so if you have additional comments after the early review, you'll have a final comment tab for those final um, comments from the panel as well. So sorry, that's not built into this application, but that this page and that's, that's how this page will be set up. Each specific comment opportunity has its own tab, but they'll all be set up on the same page and you'll just click through them. You'll have a place to add your responses um, to the comments and you'll get a notification when the comments are ready for your review. Okay, I think I'm done with my demo. Team, did I miss anything? Should I go back to something? don't have any questions. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for sticking around until 12:30. I really appreciate your time. Um, this workshop will be posted on our website later. And if again, one last endorsement to contact your grant managers as you start working on your applications, if questions come up, especially in Prism, um, it really pains me when I get an applicant calling me and said, I've been trying to figure this out for an hour. And it's something that I know and I can help them fix in five minutes. So if you find yourself like spinning your wheels, just stop and contact RCO so we can help you quickly and you don't um, you know, spend a lot of time on something that you don't need to. And uh, good luck everybody in the grant round. Thank you.